on earth are we? Why in heaven are we here? And how to make sense of this mess of our humanness and perhaps even transcend it. Welcome back everyone to season two of Dawn of an Era of Wellbeing, where we deep dive into uplift with insight, thanks to remarkably informed guests exploring the nature of our human nature and how to better relate to it. If abnormal is the new normal and perceiving is the new believing, then inner is the new outer and consciousness is our source for healing. Yet for many, it still seems like anything but the dawn of an era of well-being. From climate to war to geopolitical riddles and more, archetypes are falling, infrastructures are crumbling, nations are transitioning, bedrock is shifting. So what's going on? Well, if you look at it from the outside in, it's the same old conflictual story getting rather scary. But now we're raising the bar by raising awareness that this mess of our humanness can only be resolved from the insight out. Think about that play on words, insight as in inciting violence versus insight as in vision that emanates from a profound shift in perception about the world around us and within us. This is a mighty discussion space featuring mighty voices of loving change, two of whom are our co-hosts on this adventure through humanity's hero's journey. Let me welcome back our esteemed Irvin Laszlo, two-time Nobel Peace Prize nominee, world-renowned philosopher and system scientist, author or co-author of over 106 books, founder of the Laszlo Institute of New Paradigm Research and the Club of Budapest, and recipient of multiple honors and awards like the Goya Peace Prize, the SCC Mandir of Peace Prize, and the Luxembourg Peace Prize. And Fred Sow, business leader, futurist, practitioner of Eastern wisdom and Western science, author, chairman of the Family Business Network's Ambassador Circle, and founder of ITEA Institute and Octave Institute, fusing ancient wisdom and quantum science as a platform for people to achieve a purposeful life, mindfully lived at new levels of consciousness and freedom. Today's exceptional guest is Neil Donald Walsh. He has written 39 books on contemporary spirituality and its practical application in everyday life. Seven of the nine books in his Conversations with God series have made the New York Times bestseller list, with book number one remaining on that list for, get this, 134 weeks. His titles have been translated into 37 languages. He is the creator of CWG Connect, a global online platform connecting people who wish to more deeply explore the messages in the CWG body of work. His latest book is The God Solution. A huge welcome to you, Neil, and a welcome back to Irvin and Fred. I am going to begin by reading a passage from Neil's chapter in Dawn of an Era of Well-Being, and then a question to jumpstart this very compelling discussion with everyone. Here we go. I quote, what's the purpose of continuing our millennia-long struggle to create possibilities for heading toward a better world if we are not even of this world? Our species has been trying to figure this out for 50 millennia. This endless search has resulted in over 4,300 religions being practiced on this planet today, with the followers of each feeling deeply assured that they have found the answer. With all of this thinking and all of these theologies endlessly making efforts to show us the way, quote unquote, we still as a species find ourselves unable to take the most elementary steps toward becoming an advanced civilization. Like, just getting along, for instance, there has been armed conflict somewhere on this planet for 92% of recorded history. Is it possible that there is something we don't fully understand about God, about life, and about ourselves, the understanding of which would change everything? I'm going to suggest that the answer is yes and propose that what we don't understand fully is how to meld the physical aspect of our lives with the metaphysical reality of our true identity. I am suggesting that our ongoing dysfunction as a civilization goes back to what we believe about our maker. I have an idea that humanity would hugely benefit at this stage if we could come up with an idea about the higher power that all the world's religions and cultures could agree on. 
This idea could then become the basis for a new global ethic to be applied to politics, economics, social interactions, and our spiritual expressions. Quote, unquote, this is big, compelling terrain, and with great respect to all the world religions and all of our listeners, let's explore this conversation by starting with this question this question, after which I will turn it over to our maestro, Irvin Laszlo. Here's the question. There seem to be, if you will, two gods in our warring world. The god of pure love, as, as Neil has beautifully uh, articulated, and then the quote-unquote god of human ego, which is woven into religiosity, spiritual demagoguery, political leadership, etc. So how in heaven can a global collective that's so diverse and divided reach mass consensus about a new global ethic without falling prey to that familiar trap of egoic hierarchy? Where to find how to trust such an unbiased authority to pronounce this world-shifting decision when, number one, world religions and global institutions themselves face credibility issues, and I'm thinking certainly of the Catholic Church. Number two, AI is literally redefining the very notion of what it means to be human. And number three, leadership power still prevails over much of the world's infrastructures and toxic, outdated systems. So on that big, bold note, over to you, gentlemen, and welcome, Irvin and Neil <laughs> and Fred. Okay, Alison, just a small little question I know. <laughs> <laughs> There is a surface of events and there is a deep structure. The surface is chaos, is all the problems that you have listed, it's all the incoherence, it's the, it's the non-understanding between people and the denial of any higher voice or higher, higher presence here. Underneath is something is happening but that happens whether we know it or not, whether we guide it or not, or this would benefit a great deal from our guidance, guidance such as you get in Neil's books, for example, among, uh, above all. But uh, this something that is happening is a kind of structure, is a process that has been underway in this universe since this universe was born 13.8 billion years ago, and that's evolution. Without evolution in this universe, the universe today would consist of random swirling quantum, quantum particles, inert gases, without any structure. That's how it was after the Big Bang. And if you had purely random interaction among quantum elements and quantum particles and quantum fields, then this is what we have, would have today, because chance interactions don't produce the universe that we live in today. This is now very, very clearly coming through from the new sciences, the system sciences, the quantum sciences, and so on. So to make this shorter, there is something here on, in the depths of all things which can come through in human consciousness if we allow it. And it comes through in, in, in spiritual people, in enlightened and awakened people. So this is something which is, I call the attractor, the evolutionary attractor, an attractor toward creating integral complex systems. This is what's happening on Earth. We have more of these systems, more structure in, on this Earth than we ever had before. Now even humanity is operating on a global level, moving together, even if you're not always in, ha in harmony and in synthesis, but it's in communication. We are moving together as a species with all the problems, all the non-linearities, all the contradictions that this involves. But this process is there and it's progressing. We are moving on to a global level. Whatever we do now, we do it more or less aware that we are addressing all of humanity and practically all of terrestrial nature. So there is a movement toward coherence. And this, this movement is, is reflected in awakened and sensitive individuals as a sense of oneness, the sense of belonging. This is still yet a small percentage of the critical mass that we need, but it's spreading. 
And the famous four-letter word that we really need more than anything else, which is love, is something that is being handled. This is being discussed more than ever before, even in political circles. That's not that's the last, perhaps, but even there. But certainly in economic and business circles and in ecological circles, we know that we belong together. We know that we have one destiny. We even know as according to the rediscovery in science, that even our consciousness is not a plural. As Schrodinger said, there's no sense in which you can talk about consciousness in the plural. Consciousness is one. We have one consciousness, and the universe has one consciousness. And that consciousness is coming to expression despite of all the problems that appear on the surface. I don't want to say more at this point. I'm happy to get back to it, but I'd like to see here Neil what he thinks because he's been articulating a voice that brings forth these deeper connections, this deeper oneness, the deeper love on the on in the earth, despite of the surface problems. So is this voice still coming, Neil? And how can we capture it? Um, I I don't have any doubt that this voice is still coming. Let me share uh, my response, uh, Irvin, to what you just said. Um, and by the way, folks, those of you who are listening and watching this, you have to know that I'm very nervous today because I'm I'm sharing this particular platform with one of the great minds of all time. And it's very difficult for me to talk uh, uh, on an equal basis with a genius such as Irvin, who has understood things that we have even barely begun to think about. So I'm grateful to even have this opportunity. But let me respond to what you said, Irvin. Irvin just told us that there is this whole process that's going on. There's this whole energetic that's coming through. And he, he I wrote down what he said. He says, this energy is coming through if we allow it. When he, when he said those words, I, I wrote them down very quickly. If we allow it were the key words that he just spoke. And I wrote a question right underneath on my notes here. What could cause us to allow it? What, what, what would motivate us to allow it to come through? And I thought about that. I thought about this before, not just uh, in this moment with, with my wonderful friend, Irvin. I've thought about this before. What could cause us to allow that voice, that energetic, that whole movement that Urban is talking about to come through? And the answer for me is our basic nature as beings. I observe that human beings are very selfish. We are in the earliest stages of our evolutionary process. We are an evolving species. I am reliably informed that we are one of the younger species in the cosmos. So we're still in, if I could use a metaphor, the adolescence, if even that, the adolescence of our growth, of our maturation process as an intelligent species in the universe. So because we are still adolescents, we use actually selfish motivations uh, to do what it is we do. That is, we think we do what is best for us with our tribal understanding of who we are and our tribal culture that hasn't worked. But here's the solution as I see it. If we can create enough of an awareness among enough of our people that it is for our own good, because we are very selfish as a species, we should be able to see, ah, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's something that's for our own good that we are not paying attention to. And here's what I notice as well about human species, Irvin. I notice that we imitate that which we agree with. We imitate that which we love, fashions. It's amazing how rapidly a fashion on the planet can take over a whole population. A catchphrases, things that you know we didn't even say five years ago. A catchphrase can run across the internet now because of our ability to communicate with each other instantly. By the way, this very program is an example of that. 
If someone had told me, Irvin, if someone had told me 15 years ago that I'd be sitting here talking with you and telecasting this with video all over the world at the same time instantaneously, I wouldn't have believed them. But now we have the technology that allows us to send information around the world. So the question is, what kind of information are we going to send around the world? And here's the here's the my, my answer. If we can come up with an idea that catches on, just like fashions catch on, just like catchphrases catch on, just like certain songs catch on, what could we cause to catch on with enough people that they say, ah, now that's it. That's what I've been waiting for. I can imitate that. What we need to do then is create a catch onable idea, <laughs> an idea that is so undeniably to our benefit that our selfish nature would cause us to gravitate toward it immediately. So the question is, what would that idea be? I've been suggesting for the past year or two that what we need to do is create a brand new idea, one single notion that we could all agree on about who and what the higher power is. I'm not going to talk much longer, but let me just share this. What I've learned in the past five years is that surveys have shown, this is amazing, anthropologists have been asking around the world in various cultures, in large places, in large civilizations, small societies, do you believe in a higher power? And believe it or not, 8.5 out of every 10 people, 85% of the people answer yes, we believe in a higher power. <laughs> We think there's something more going on here than meets the eye. There is a higher power. But what we can't agree on is what is that power about? What does it want, if anything? What does it do, if anything, if it doesn't get what it wants? And most importantly, how can we use that higher power? Now, if we can come up with a single idea that answers those questions, a single notion upon which all the world's 4,000 religions could agree, we could solve humanity's biggest problems virtually overnight. So I put that challenge in Irvin's lap because he's the most brilliant mind on the planet, or certainly one of the 10 most brilliant minds on the planet, and I am not in that group. So I'm waiting here with patience, Irvin, come <laughs> up with the single idea <laughs> that we could all agree on and we will have the problem solved. And then what you have talked about that's moving through will be allowed by us. And I'm going to ask you if you think that my idea has any value. I have a thought that if we redefine, create a new definition of God in two words, we might come up with an idea that all the world's religions, all the world's philosophies, and all the world's political parties, all the world's economic groups could agree on. What if we decided that God was simply pure love? Now, one last statement. When I say that in front of an audience, Irvin, somebody in the back of the room inevitably stands up and says, Neil, really, really? We've been listening to you for 12 minutes for you to tell me that God is love. Everybody knows that God is love. Even the religions agree on that much. Come on, Neil, you can do better than that. And I say to people, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You didn't hear me say that God is love. I said that God is pure love. Now my friend in the back of the room at the lecture hall will say, okay, what's the difference? And the difference is that pure love demands, requires, needs, expects, hopes for nothing in return. Now, if we can believe in a deity that needs, expects, hopes for, and demands nothing in return, suddenly the undergirdment, the foundation of most of the world's religions falls away. And we can't find a way for us to be righteous with each other. We suddenly stop saying things like, no, no, you don't understand. If you don't believe in God the way I believe in God, you're going to hell. I was told, Irvin, as a nine-year-old child, that if I didn't go to Mass on Sunday, if I missed Mass on Sunday, I would be 
committing a mortal sin. And that if I died, if I got hit by a car on Monday, God forbid, I'd be going straight to hell. So now if we have a new idea about God, and if we applied that in our political, economic, and social and spiritual interactions, if we decided to interact with each other socially, spiritually, economically, requiring nothing, demanding nothing, needing nothing from each other, then suddenly we would find a solution what I call the God solution. Sadly, we can't even love the person across the pillow in that way. And that's the first step. So I want to suggest to you, if you have a beloved in your life, start there. Decide as of today that you're going to love the person who shares the pillow with you in a way that says to them, you know what? I need nothing, I require nothing, and I certainly demand nothing from you. I don't love you because of what you can give me. I love you because of what I feel when I share my love with you. And I love you because simply of who you are. I hate to be simplistic. I'm sorry, I'm sure this sounds very naive, but Irvin, you're the genius among us. You give us your idea. I'm listening and waiting. <laughs> time that you've been talking, Neil, even before you got to that critical phrase, I said to myself, he means love. I think it's no other solution in this way. But how to make it understand, and you do it through your books and your, your speeches and talks, but how to get it to the most general public, that love is what we need to survive. There is an explanation, there is an a explication of that, which is current in the sciences, but it it's, may not be so readily accessible for outside. And that's coherence. Coherence means you survive when you are coherent. You become extinct when you are incoherent. Coherence simply means being finely tuned within yourself to all your cells together, so they are healthy and work together, finely tuned between you and, the, and, in, and your neighbor and your pillow partner, as you say, or, or your, your neighbor on the street and your neighbor in the next state or countries on the other side of the earth. Because coherence means simply that you are responding and you act together. There is one very key element coming forth in the sciences, which ought to be better known. If you are not finely tuned to eat to your every bit of your body, and if your whole organism is not finely tuned to your entire environment, to the other people around you, you have an incoherence, which is a disease. And this disease can become a cancer. A cancer is simply the incoherence of a part of the organism with the rest of the organisms. It's coming apart separately. The, a, a, a cancer group of cells says, I am coherent within myself. I am not coherent with the others because I just grow, grow without respect for the rest of the organism. And that kills the organism. To understand that on this earth, we can only survive if we are coherent because we are a very finely, delicately balanced species. It's another thing that we know from thermodynamics and from the new physical chemistry and, and, and physiology. We are so finely balanced that any small deviation from the balance can dis disconnect us from each other, from one cell of the two, from the other, for us from the neighborhood, from other people around you. We are what is known as a non-equilibrium species. We survive far from equilibrium. Now, equilibrium in this case, I don't want to have a, get into a science lecture here, but equilibrium means nothing new is happening. Equilibrium is dead. When it arrives there, then that's what everything is straightened out. That's how you are just, just existing. Nothing new is happening. Can Nothing new can happen. Non-equilibrium, it's not disequilibrium, it's not disequilibrium, it's non-equilibrium. It's far from this inert state. It's a highly mobilized state. Life is not possible except in a far from equilibrium condition. This we know in physics, no question about it. But how to get it across? And this is really a task, a task for you, Neil, 
for people like you, of the first of the foremost among those people who can get spirituality across the wide public. We need to be delicately balanced to each other so that we compensate for any deviation from this delicately balanced state. We immediately compensate and we cut together. We can only do this together. We can only do this if all parts of the organism work together, then it's healthy. We can only survive on this planet if all people work together to maintain, to maintain viability on the planet. We are getting further and further away from viability because we are creating willfully, egoistically kind of technologies, kind of processes, kind of resource uses and kind of environmental equilibrium that are unsustainable. Coherence through love. What Neil, you're talking about is unconditional love. That I think is the key for people to feel. That's what we got to feel. What I'm saying, what I've been saying is just to help people who want to get an understanding of why that is so important, help them to tell them, unless you feel that love and you act that love, you will become a cancer and you can destroy the system and so you can destroy yourself. We are in this delicately balanced situation and a tipping point. Before we had more healthier intuitions, we have healthier instincts. We wanted to live in the lap of nature more than we do today. The indigenous people still want to do that, they still understand. But in the Western world, in the technological world, we just go out after what we think is good for us in the short term and never mind the consequences. And that is this kind of self-love without the external love, incoherence in our relations to each other. So we need love to reestablish that, to create again that coherence that we need simply to survive. You know, well, well over 90%, 99% of the complex species since the Cambrian age have become extinct. Why not humanity? Sure, we can become extinct. It's even very likely that we become extinct, except for one thing. We have consciousness, we have some insight into what is happening, and we could act with that insight. Allow this deeper element to come forth. That is the task that we could do. We are not make we people love each other. We allow them to love each other and the world around us unconditionally all of nature, all of the universe. We cannot be healthy unless all species on this earth are healthy. We are not truly healthy. We can just, just and just manage to survive. So unconditional love, yes, get it across and get it across in a way that most people can accept. Some people will want to ascribe this to an external personalized source, which they call God or the great spirit or the Tao or whatever. Other people will want to say, no, this, this we must look for in nature. Maybe it's on the cosmos, in, in the cosmos, in, in, in the universe itself. I belong to those who don't say, yes, it's very possible, very likely. And Neil knows that better than I do, better than almost anybody else, that there is this voice. But I feel by intuition is that I have a, a, an insight, a tendency, a drive toward being coherent with others, simply being one with other, communicating, understanding other people so that we can together move forward. I feel that. And I think that feeling, that feeling, that sense of belonging is the practical payoff of unconditional love. And how to get that across? This is a job for Neil. I try to provide a rationale for it. I mean, other people around me in the new sciences, the rationale is in a non-equilibrium system, you either work together or you stop working. And but now we here we are. We better not become extinct willfully. Let's do everything we can to survive and to thrive. We can, but we have to feel love and we have to practice coherence. <laughs> no pressure. I, I love it when when Irvin says, "I'll give you the rationale, but Neil, it's your job to get get it across to the rest of humanity." And my first reaction is, "Oh, no pressure." <laughs> <laughs> it is your job, Neil. It is your job. You have undertaken it. You are doing it. You keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
here, here, here. I don't disagree with you, but by the way, I, I, I was given three assignments by the voice that Irvin is talking about. I call it God. As he said, there are a thousand names for God, Yahweh, Jehovah, Brahman, whoever, you know, nature, that which is the, the, the essential essence, the primal energy, you call it what you want to call it. But I hear that voice in a particular way. And that voice said to me, Neil, I'm going to give you three assignments. Here's your mission in this lifetime. Number one, change the world's mind about God. Number two, give people back to themselves. Number three, awaken the species. Wake them up. So I've taken on that assignment, and I don't want to be egotistical about it. I, I hope people do not feel that I somehow think I'm somehow larger than or more powerful than or better in any way than anyone else. I think we are, interestingly enough, all given the same assignment. I think every one of us is 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 given that an opportunity, and we're simply playing in the orchestra of the universe, playing the same sheet music, but with different instruments. So we're all playing Mozart, but I've got a violin, and you've got a, a clarinet, and, 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 and you've got a, a timpani drum, and we're all playing our instruments, but we're playing the same song. And the song is the great dance of life itself. Who are we? Let me put in front of you a question, my dear friends, and see if this question resonates with you. I believe the answer for us is for us to decide who we really are. Am I simply a physical entity? Am, am I simply a, this, a body and a mind? Am I just a, a physical creature, not unlike a, a bird in the sky or a fish in the sea? You know, maybe more complex, perhaps, but simply a chemical creature when it comes to right down to it. I'm born, I live, I die, and that's the beginning and the end of it. Or is it possible, just possible, that I'm more than that? Is it possible that I am actually a spiritual being having a physical experience? I hate to sound so trite. I hate to sound so predictable. But if that were true, then my whole reason for living would be different. My whole reason for acting with each other would be different. And the movement toward unconditional love, the movement toward coherence that Irvin is talking about would suddenly become not only possible, but rational. See, here's the problem, folks. Most people think that unconditional love is irrational because they feel that unconditional love, to love each other without condition, works against our very survival. Because people think that survival is the basic instinct. Ah, but here's something for us to consider. What if survival was not the basic instinct? My dear friends, if survival was the basic instinct, you would not run out in front of a bus to save the toddler, the, the three-year-old child who has inadvertently stumbled out in front of the intersection. Surveys have shown that the average person would run out and save that child and push the child out of the way, even at the risk of being hit by the bus themselves. If you're walking down the street and you see a burning building off to the side, oh my God, the building's on fire. Does anybody know the building's on fire? And you hear a baby crying where, where? from the second story window. What do you do? Do you turn around and say, well, that's too bad. I guess there's a baby in there. Isn't that sad? Of course not. You run into the building and do what you can to save that baby. You don't think, gosh, will I live another 20 minutes? You think, how will I live for the next 20 minutes? Who am I really? Am I an entity that would allow that baby to die in that burning building? without at least giving it a try to save that child? And of course, you run into the burning. Surveys have shown, I'm not making this up, surveys have shown that the average person would, would not even think about it. 
the average person would run into the burning building to save that child. So here's my solution, folks. Think of every moment as a burning building moment. Because the building of humanity is burning down. And the children of tomorrow are not going to survive. But survival is not the basic instinct. The basic instinct is the expression of our true nature. And our true nature is divinity. Our true nature is coherence. Our true nature is unconditional love. And when the chips are down, we express our true nature. Even the most jaded among us would run out in front of the bus if we saw a four-year-old child racing into the intersection without looking. All of us would do that because that's who we really are. So all we have to know now is, you know what? The bus is coming. The train is coming down the tracks. And the car of humanity is standing in the middle of the tracks. Get in the car and get off the tracks. So we can save this wonderful species that we call humanity for an even brighter tomorrow. By not paying attention to survival, but by paying attention to our higher calling, our higher nature. The basic instinct of humanity is not survival. The basic instinct is the expression of our true nature, the expression of our divinity. I am suggesting to you, my dear friends, that we are all individuations of divinity. We are all singularizations of the singularity. And as that, we seek to experience and express and to demonstrate our true nature. When we connect with that idea that I'm not this, this is not who I am. I'm not my body. I'm not my mind. I am that which has a body and a mind. And I'm using these as instruments with which to declare and announce, express and fulfill, become and experience, demonstrate my true nature as unconditional love, my true nature as divinity. Because, and here's, here's the big one, ready for this? Because death does not exist. I will never die. I will simply change my identity. I asked God, what is this thing called death? What is death? Give it to me in one sentence. God said, I'll tell you in one sentence simply. Death is simply a process of re-identification. Death is simply a process by which you suddenly realize once again who you really are. And you move from one sphere, from the physical sphere, to another sphere, the metaphysical sphere, what I call the spiritual realm. And you're reunited once again with the highest and grandest notion you ever held about who you really are. Now, there's a way to get to that place without having to die. You don't have to go through a process called death. We can create heaven on earth. We were designed to create it, but it's up to you. It's up to us. God isn't going to do it for us. God isn't going to wave a magic wand and make everything better tomorrow. God is saying, you know what? I've given you free will. You have the opportunity to do that, beginning here, beginning right now. And so my invitation to you, my dear friends, watching this podcast, pay attention to how you are today, how you move through the world, what you think and what you say and what you do. Does it have coherence? And by coherence, my definition means... In my world, coherence means that your true nature and your present expression become one. Why do you think that we do this when we pray? Because we see physically what we're doing. I'm taking who I think I am and who I actually am, and I bring it together in the center. And I meld my own limited ideas with my unlimited awareness and become one. 
with myself and then with you. That's why we make love. We become one with each other. All the world is a sexual experience, synergistic energy exchange. So let's have sex with everyone. That's my solution. <laughs> I knew Neil was going in that direction. Now that's a catchable concept, isn't it? In the best sense. I, I, I just want to ask one question of, of Neil, actually of both of you, but I'll, I'll, I'll direct this to you, Neil. <clears throat> you do suggest uh, over the course of time, obviously, that aspects, all aspects of your life were in a state of breakdown as precursor for conversations with God to break through. So are we as a planet on the precipice of a collective version of your individual experience, given that systemic breakdown is everywhere and will, as Irvin says, there's not yet enough of us to hear that metaphoric voice to take action, but it's growing. What do you think, Neil, Irvin? I invite you both. Well, in my conversations with God, I was told directly that. I was told this is the best time. This is a, an, a, a very powerful time. This is the, the, the most uh, important time because, in fact, all the systems are breaking down. No, nothing is working. Our political systems are no longer working. Our economic systems are no longer working. Our social systems are no longer working. And hello, with all due respect, even our spiritual systems are no longer working. Everything is breaking down. But when things break down, that's the time for us to build them up again in a brand new way. So if we see this not as an obstacle, but as an opportunity, the greatest opportunity that humanity has ever faced, then we can change our collective tomorrows and produce the coherence that my dear friend Urban is talking about. But we must do it together. Walt Kelly was a cartoonist in the, in, 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 and uh, on um, the 31st of October in 1987, he created a cartoon character called Pogo. And Pogo made the following statement, we have met the enemy and he is us. Now we have an opportunity to change the line of Pogo. We have met the Savior, and He is us. That was the great message of all the spiritual messengers of all time, not just Jesus, not just Buddha, not just Muhammad, bless his holy name, not just Buddha, not, not just a few of the great messengers, male and female through the years, not just Catherine of Genoa or Julian of Norwich or Beatrice of Nazareth, not just the great spiritual masters. All people who understand the truth of spirituality have said the same thing that Jesus said 2,000 years ago. Why are you so amazed? These things and more shall you do also. But he gave us the formula. He said it's really very simple. It's really very simple. Follow these instructions and avoid excessive use. <laughs> love, love, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Do good to those who would do you evil. When a man slaps you on the right cheek, turn and offer him your left. When a man steals your coat, give him your shirt as well. When a man demands that you walk one mile with him, go with him twain. Does that mean that we allow anyone to abuse us, to do anything they want with us? No. But it means that we love them enough to have the compassion that allows us to see the wound that has caused their behavior and then to step into the healing of that wound by loving ourselves enough to show them the way, by being the way. It's all very simple. He gave us the answer. Buddha gave us the answer. Muhammad, all the great masters have given us the answer. It's time for us now to listen. Let those who have ears to hear. Listen. That's mm. stunning. If I'm to add one word to this, 
is to say that we have got to overcome this separation between physical and spiritual. What Neil is saying sounds spiritual, and a lot of people will say, but what about physical reality? And I would say the universe is not physical. Univer uni universe is psychophysical. Consciousness is as deep an element in it as energy and information, and much deeper than matter. Matter per se, Max Planck said it, and many scientists say it's not really real, not, bottom, not, the, not the bottom real. We are psychophysical. We have a consciousness, and the consciousness that is our in our consciousness is part of the cosmic consciousness. The deepest understanding beyond all the explanations and advice that we can give is that this universe is alive and is conscious. The cosmos is itself a consciousness. Just lately, they, they discovered that shortly after the Big Bang, the, the processes of the physical universe were so finely tuned together that they were connected. They were, they were practically one shortly <laughs> after the Big Bang. This universe was not born in incoherence. It's, it was born as a field of spiritual oneness already there. It's developing gradually. We are misrepresenting it, but it's time to get back. Because ultimately, the oneness that we talk about is, is we, what we, is the universe. There is no separate spirituality. There is no separate physics. The aim of evolution is not survival, as Neil says, but by that, that he means physical survival. The aim of evolution is thrival, flourishing, growing together, evolving as psychophysical beings. We are not a physical being and a psychological being or psychic being. We are both because the universe as such is both. The universe was born in the mind as a mind of a supreme highest level authority. God, uh, Neil calls it God. We can call it all the other names as well. But what but, uh, but this, this name applies to is not something that's in the universe. That it applies to is the universe. It's the cosmos in which the universe was born. And that is what we have got to rediscover. We are psychophysical being. We have a consciousness which is one with all consciousness everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. this, discovering this, we will naturally love others as we love ourselves because the others are ourselves. We are mm -hmm. together. We are one together. This comes from the sciences and it's now coming to the surface. And if it becomes popular knowledge, then we can have the kind of insight that Neil is talking about becoming widely spread. Not saying this is only spirituality. No, this is physics. This is psychophysics. This is the deepest level of quantum reality in the world. In the 4,000 pages of the Conversations with God material, on the first 10 pages of the 4,000 pages, I was told this. All things are one thing. There is only one thing, and all things are part of the one thing there is. Exactly. It's really quite simple. It's really quite simple. This is so profound, profoundly simple. And I'm going to ask a question now that may seem also so obvious, or perhaps it's not. But if so much of this world and our dissension between one, and one another is about projection, projection of internal disturbances within ourselves onto other, other people, other situations, and uh, you have posed this question, Neil, before about when we've been hurt by someone to ask what hurts you so much that you have to hurt me. Is it possible that we need to do this not only as nation states on behalf of very bad historic collective behavior towards one another, but also to ourselves? For example, did you ultimately ask this of yourself, to yourself that inflicted so much hurt onto your being that resulted in loss of marriage, job, health. D did you 
do that self-inquiry? And is that something that if one doesn't have a beloved on the pillow next to them, perhaps that beloved is at least self? Shall we all ask that of each other? Why? I think, I think yes. the question is self-answering. I, 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 think, I think you are asking an obvious question to which the yes. answer is equally obvious. Yes. Of course, of course, it has to begin here. Mm. And, and, and yes, when my life fell apart, mm. you know, when I was what, 53, 54 years old, a half century, folks, I was on the planet a half century. And I didn't understand anything. Everything was falling apart. I lost my relationship. I lost my job. I lost my health. I broke my neck in a car accident. An older gentleman drove into me and, and, and I broke my neck. I should have died. The doctor told me, you know, eight out of 10 people who suffer a broken neck die instantly because of many physiological complications. And, and if they don't die, they at least wind up being at least partially paralyzed. You didn't suffer either outcome. The doctor looked me in the face and he said, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? Because you've been given an extraordinary gift here. And I hope you see that. The doctor was very direct with me and very clear. And yes, did, did that start a process of self-inquiry? Uh, duh, you think so? Of course I went home and I asked myself all the questions that one would ask oneself when one is being honest with oneself. What is going on here and who am I? And why have I failed at marriage? Why have I failed at my life work? Why, why can't... What does it take to make life work? What is it that I don't fully understand? And then I began to search, and I began to search inside. I didn't go outside and run to the library and try to pick up every book I could find. I went inside and I said, okay, if there really is a source of wisdom in the universe, it must also reside within me because I'm part of the universe. I am part of that whole system. So what I'm searching for must be equally within me. And I went deep within myself and I asked myself, what is it that I don't remember that I now have an opportunity to call forth? Folks, let me end with this. Life is not a school in my awareness. Life is not a school where we have to learn what we need to know in order to be who we truly already are. I, I said to God, life must be a school. And God said to me, Neil, 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 is there a tree outside your window? And I said, yes, there's a beautiful tree outside the window. And she said, how, how big is the tree? I said, well, the tree is probably 25, 30 feet tall, a beautiful canopy. It's a beautiful oak tree. God said, what has the tree learned from the time it was a seedling, a seed no bigger than your fingernail? I said, well, the tree hasn't really learned anything. The tree has simply grew into itself. And God said to me, wait a minute, Neil, are you telling me that I implanted in that seed all the information the tree needed to know to become the beautiful expression of life that it has become? I said, yes, that's what I'm telling you. It was all encoded in the seed, no bigger than my fingernail. And God said to me, sweetheart, if I so love the tree, would I not all the more love you? Mm. Consider the possibility that I have encoded within you everything you need to know to be who you truly are. Just call it forth and use every moment of your life as an opportunity to do so. Because if you look carefully into all the moments of your life, you will see them that way. You will see them at, ah, another chance to be who I truly am. Mm. Exquisite. Obvious, exquisite, and we need to hear that over and over and over. Maybe that becomes the lullaby for an entire planet. Irvin. Any thoughts that you'd like to share? I have another question, but I will wait. <laughs> well, just no final word. This is a dialogue that has to continue. Uh, indeed. What is encoded in us 
is everything that we need. And if you need to allow it to come forth. <laughs> if we don't allow it, we will kill each other, which we are doing in great measure already. But we need conversations like this to allow that consciousness, which is in the cosmos, to become manifest in us. You can express it spiritually or in terms of physics, but as I said, the two things come together now. We are in a psychophysical world. We are psychophysical beings. We have, a, we have an organism, a biological organism, and we have a brain, but we also have a mind, a consciousness. And those things are together. <sighs> Conversations like this can help us. It's not a big task. It's not something you learn, as Neil says. It's something that you allow to happen. Mm -hmm. All the Eastern religions, as Neil knows better than anyone, has already been always been talking about allowing, resting, allowing, going back, meditating, allowing your deepest thought, the intuitions to come forth. If you can couple it with the ra rational understanding, the assurance that this is not just imagination, this is now the, the new science, the quantum science, the new paradigm science, which we are discovering, then we had no that we can do it with confidence. Uh, unconditional love is something which is real, something that which is need, and something that we can that can save us, that I think will save us. We just need more discussions like this, then we will call it force. Couldn't agree more. And what I'm hearing from both of you today in this discussion is an interesting um, interesting dynamic. We're talking about the dynamic of allowing ultimately. And so often it seems that what prompts individuals to be brought to their knees to even want to be in that receptive state of inquiry, of, of changing, is pain. I don't know if that is an old paradigm dynamic that we still need to experience such discomfort that compels us to finally surrender and say, all right, I'll allow, help me. Or is there a new paradigm dynamic that, in a sense, Neil was proposing with a catchable something? Uh, or are those two somehow intrinsically linked? I don't know, but could you both clarify that? Uh, the catchable uh, sort of seduction of something very tantalizing that will inspire us to want to allow change versus being so distraught, being brought to such a point of despair and pain that the world is in. I think it's the attraction of joy. For me, for me, mm -hmm. what you're saying, Allison, is it's the attraction of joy. We can either move through life trying to avoid pain, or we can move through life mm -hmm. being attracted by joy. I don't mean to be inappropriate, but we're all adults here. So I can tell you this, when I climb into bed mm -hmm. with my wife, mm -hmm. I don't become attracted to pain. It's not my, I don't I don't I don't think about how I can experience joy because of, of how painful I feel. I so I, I I I have the expectation of joy and bliss and happiness in, in a physical level and also at a metaphysical level where the two in fact become one. <laughs> if you have ever experienced romantic love with another person physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, you understand what Irvin is saying, that there's no separation between our physical expression and our so-called spiritual expression. The two become one. And when I am in the arms of my beloved, in that moment of union, I realize, oh, there's no separation at all from divinity and humanity. The two are one so let's make love with everyone in whatever way the day offers us an opportunity to do so let me share with you a simple example a, f a few a, a couple of years ago i, I came out of a, 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 of a coffee shop and a policeman was putting a ticket on my car and i walked over to him and i said officer could, could i talk with you a minute and i know he thought i was going to be upset he said yeah what do you want i said I just want to tell you something. I, I, it's, it's important for me to let you know something. I said, I am not unaware 
that when you put that silver badge on your chest in the morning, you are making a promise that you will put yourself between danger and me, that you will sacrifice, if you have to, your life in order to save mine. I'm clear of the promise you make when you put that piece of metal on your chest in the morning. And I'm clear that you take that promise seriously or you wouldn't be doing it. So I want you to know that I see that in you and I thank you for the promise that you have made. And he walked over to me and he said, Mister, I've been on this force for 27 years and no one has ever said anything like that to me. I said, I'm glad it came to my mind to share it with you today. I want you to know something, my friend. I see you. That's what I call synergistic energy exchange. It's not saying stuff that isn't true. I don't make stuff up. It's not false flattery. It's the truth. Simply walk up to people, whether it's the lady at the coffee shop, the guy at the post office, or the policeman on the street, and simply say the truth of what you love about them. You will find something to love when you see yourself in them. And so, guys, you know, Gandhi said it perfectly. He put it perfectly in one simple sentence. What's the solution? What can each individual do? Be the change you wish to see. As simple as that. My friends, this has been an extraordinary discussion. I could go on forever, but I have the feeling that our listeners may want to have a bite to eat or go to sleep and reflect. But uh, uh, if there are any last thoughts before we end this part of this never ending discussion, as Irvin is rightfully saying, an ongoing discourse, please, uh, I, I invite you to say any any final thoughts and then we will wrap it up. <clears throat> Irvin, My Neil. thought is to thank Neil, to thank you in these conversations, in conversations about love, about coherence, and about who we are. I think that helps opening it up, whether it's the, whether it's the policeman in the corner, or whether it's somebody sitting across from us, or some other part of the, of the, of the earth, because we are connected through the internet, in, independently of where we are, doesn't matter. We encounter each other, we talk to each other, and we share who we believe we are, then eventually it will come through who we really are by true sharing. Thank you for this conversation. Thanks, Neil, very much for this conversation. And thanks for the organizers of this podcast series. Indeed. Neil? Neil is sitting in such a, a poised, relaxed state. Uh, I feel like this has <laughs> permeated your entire being, as I'm sure that it has for Irvin as well. Neil? I asked, I asked God, sweetie, could you just tell me in one sentence, without going into a book-length description, <laughs> could you just give it to me in one sentence, the solution, how I can change my life, be happier, more joyful, and bring impact to the world at large? And she said, oh, it's so simple. Write this down. Your life, Neil, is not about you in the singular form. It's not about local you. Your life is about universal you. Your life is about everyone else whose life you touch and the way in which you touch it. And so when I leave the house in the morning, when I come home at night, I think of those things. Your life is about everyone else whose life you touch and the way in which you touch it. And when I touch the lives of other people in the way that demonstrates my grandest thought, my grandest notion about life, about that other person, and yes, about myself, I feel more glorious, more joyful than I could even begin to describe. Now, you know, folks, I could be wrong about all of this. 
but I don't think so. Oh my, thank you so much for this extraordinary discussion with our hosts, Irvin Laszlo and Fred Sal, and our brilliant guest, Neil Donald Walsh, who I will now nickname Neil Donald Wish, because the wish is that if NASA, NASA's DART mission, which just successfully occurred yesterday to collide its spacecraft into an asteroid, which diverted its hazardous course, this at the expense of $330 million to protect our Earth, then you think we might find a way to avert a collision course with our destructive human nature and pivot that perspective on a healthy new orbit? I wish so, I hope so, and I want to believe so. So here's to that wish with people like Neil Donald Walsh, Neil Donald Wish. Thank you all and to our worldwide audience and wonderful production team led by Nora Cesar, Kenichi Sugihara, Fabrizio Beria, and those at ITEA Institute. I'm Alison Goldwyn, inviting you to join us for more podcast episodes and to gift a copy of Dawn of an Era of Wellbeing book to yourself or a loved one. It's a great companion during challenging times. From whatever nation state or emotional state you might be in, dawn of an era of well-being is the place to tune in. The bravado of our ego has historically gotten the better of us. So remember, when building that new paradigm for humankind, let's include humankindness. Stay tuned and stay attuned. And now to conclude our program, here are some thoughts from our co-host, Fred Sal. Hi, everybody. I want to thank um, the provoking thoughts of uh, uh, Neil and Irvin. You know, there are a few things that come to my attention. Um, the two gods, uh, the current ethic issues, um, the um, how, the how. Um, I hope maybe I can give some response kind of spontaneously from where I am. So indeed, this current state of sustainability is caused by uh, and, uh, an ethical check of the uh, market economy, where um, the direction of the market economy is purely motivated by self-interest. Uh, and you can see it, uh, this industrialization uh, making to uh, much more effective and uh, uh, standardized ways of approaching. And it is driven by ego. And uh, ego is driven by the story we make up for ourselves our collective understanding, our desire, because uh, economics is nothing to meet our desire. So what do we desire? And through marketing, we manipulate the, the desire. We stimulate uh, the worst in us sometimes, like greed, like vanity, uh, ignorance, even hatred. Military uh, industry is a huge business. So, how can we change that? First of all, the uh, market economy or the commercial or the business sector of the economics <clears throat> has become the dominant driver dominant driver, and they actually guide where the world's going. They're responsible for many things, politics, education, many things, healthcare. So this institution first has to change. This excuse that you have to only look after your self-interest that make business institutions separate from humanity 
Business school used to be part of the school of sociology, it's part of management school. But it becomes an independent school now. So all you need to do business is to make money. Well, luckily, it's not long that long ago. It's still within this 100 years, maybe 80 years or 60 years. It's something still fairly new after the Second World War. But you can see that the speeding up of it is actually damaging. But Adam Smith is not entirely wrong. In fact, he was right. Gradually, as we see on the sustainable world, gradually, when we deal with the unsustainable world, then we awaken to it. Because Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiment is there. Human being is the most self-aware species on Earth. And their moral sentiments arise putting movement um, in business, they're moving towards ESG and impact investment nowadays. They went through triple bottom line, conscious capitalism, social entrepreneurship, so forth, so forth. But business is supposed to be social anyway, because it's supposed to serve human desire, except they manipulate the desire towards the wrong direction without their action and consideration of a bigger picture. That's why you have social entrepreneurs. Business is supposed to be social. And so within the business, you have its own movement of all what you said. <clears throat> and now social and environmental governance is coming in strong, ESG. And the impact investments on the rise. ESG is just boundaries of where we should not cross. That there's some code of conduct that business should have. And impact investment, this direction it goes. And we want impact, including ourselves within the system, because life is everything, the whole universe, and we are in life. So when we make an impact to ourselves, we impact the whole system. When we make an impact outside, they make their own impact to us ourselves too. It's not separable. Except that is being unfold. So yes, we are probably a young species. What I know is maybe three million years. Consider four and a half billion years of Earth. This is a, a drop, a tick in the time frame. So at this particular crossroad, we indeed have two paths. The path to follow our unchecked desire, our greed, our, our adversity, our hatred, our ignorance, and follow that unchecked desire. Continue consumerism. Continue the direction of self-indulgence. However, we have another rope, the path to be truly who we are, which is love. As we are made in the image of God, and God's omnipotent and omnipresent. Why? To the Chinese. That's because the cosmos is invisible, holistic, and everywhere. And today, science, we know, is a field theory. At least we know 17 fields that's affecting us. But miraculously, they dance in synchrony. So therefore, the unified field theory of consciousness is one of the things that people are contemplating over. So there's a relationship between cosmos, which is its essence, and the relationship of the universe which is the material expression. So we too have this thing. We are made of love because we are holistic, inseparable, one. But we're also 
the universe, the material expression. And doing God's work, because we're the most conscious of ourselves, therefore the most conscious of God, we have to go back to the source and then understand the work we have to do for purpose. So, Maslow hierarchy of needs, they talked about basic needs and sense of belonging, which is collective needs. And also talk about self-esteem and finally self-actualization. But we don't know who self is, but we have a beacon. Everybody asks existential question, who am I? Where did I come from? What are we here to do? What am I here to do? And you have to listen to your deeper reality of your consciousness, or the cosmos that make us. And then we have to do what we're here to do. Now, we've gone through uh, survival, we've gone through indulgence of consumerism, many awaken to find purpose in life, to find joy. Now the Chinese uh, talk about happiness in two levels. There's a quick happiness, which will come and go if you follow your ego, and then your original state, which you already enjoy already is your nature and that when you find it it's always there and the ability to understand and, and desire a higher level of joy is when people are looking for their purpose of their existence and doing what they're here to do which is self-actualization so in this year of well-being and happiness, a paradigm advocated by the United Nations, that's the new paradigm of economics. We need to discover and turn the direction from external to internal. A journey of external seeking and acquisition to an internal understanding and awakening and therefore creating a better world. What is a better world? That is a question. But there are some KPIs. A more unified world, a world that moving us to meet all our needs so we can finally do our job, what the Chinese call the Tao, or the quantum scientists, I would put it, the evolutionary energy. And it has a beacon of returning its source, where this evolutionary energy came from. So go to the source, the cosmos, to discover our love, nature, our joy, nature, our peace, nature, our being. Now, being doesn't mean you do nothing. In fact, being, you do everything you're supposed to do. So going back to the cosmos and listen, and then coming back to the material world and to the work of evolution, of Tao, of unity, of creating a better world. What is a better world? From a value system point of view, if we can say we're adding value to life, the whole system. And the scientists would know well-being is coherency. <clears throat> 
of course, in the modern mind, body, spirit world, that's called oneness, alignment. And we know when we're aligned, what we need to do, what is better. Better is always coherency. And the expression, which quantum scientists know, which is just clustering of energy to give an appearance of form, rising our consciousness back to the source, and then relying on that as our guiding, and walk through a process and rewiring a neural wiring so we can change the way we see the world. And from there, chose, choose our, our actions. Do not be brought away by the seduction of our centuries that create all these desires, but rather truly pierce through it to see that they're just nothing but energy vibrating together. So, yeah, how do we get there? Oh, well, in fact, all the religions have modality to help us get there. They cannot run away from the structure of the process, which is finally going to rewire our neural wiring. In the neural wiring, it already included our personalities. The way we think, the way we move, everything. So practice is important. The act of compassion and giving and service, the intellectual framing and understanding that we can learn from the sages and the community that supports us on this journey of life. the expression of love and evolution on this material world. So they align to our cosmic origin. I think quantum paradigm is a language we need to talk about the same thing that all these sages that became religion or philosophy or even culture can modernize to the 21st century of the global reality and technology enhanced human connections and information. Information technology is now moving onto myoinformation. Indeed, we can only we can create our own mind, the possibilities through metaverse, human connectivity, machine human interface, organic, inorganic information creation, including biotech of creating a chicken meat without the chicken. This is a time that we're doing true God's work, but we need to be directed in with the right direction because technology is nothing but an enhancement process to support us do evolution work, to make the world more coherent, to make our inner world first most coherent. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Dawn of an Era of Wellbeing is a co-production of the Laszlo Institute, ITEA Institute, and Select Books. It's produced by Nora Cesar and Kenichi Sugihara with theme music Chimera by Biba DuPont. The book, Dawn of an Era of Wellbeing, co-authored by Irvin Laszlo and Frederick Sal, is available wherever books or e-books are sold. Please subscribe to Dawn of an Era of Wellbeing, the podcast, on Apple or Spotify for more fascinating guests and discussion. My name is Allison Goldwyn, founder and creative director of Synchronistory.com, a future party for the planet broadcast live worldwide. Wishing you well-being till we talk again next week.